And I will next speaker is Fabien Vinquet. Thanks, Mathias. Uh, so first, I would like to thank the organizer. So today, I will uh, talk about uh, um, motivation and depression, actually. Uh, so first, I will show you that I'm very motivated by money because I have a lot of conflict of interest uh, with a lot of uh, labs. Uh, and I guess only one is related to, to this talk, and I will uh, talk about that at the end. Okay, so definition of motivation. So motivation is a polysemic word uh, that have basically three acceptation. First, uh, motivation could be defined as a content, the goal of, of my action, I'm motivated by something. It could be defined as a process, the set of mechanisms that uh, drive behavior in terms of direction, choosing an action A compared to an action B, or in terms of intensity, the quantity of resource I would like to invest in a given action, or uh, in terms of a state, a trait, a description of an agent, I'm more or less uh, motivated. My uh, Personal definition, I would say, is the second one. Uh, this is the one I use in the lab, but in the clinics, uh, we use mainly the third uh, definition. And uh, actually, we speak a lot about motivation uh, deficits because it's something we encounter a lot uh, in the clinics. And actually, uh, motivation deficit is a part uh, in psychiatry of, uh, well, it's even in the core definition of several um, um, disorder, including uh, schizophrenia and depression with loss of interest or apathy. And we have a lot of fancy words to try to dissect or to describe motivation deficits uh, that uh, medical students have to learn during their, uh, yeah. Um, there are also some diseases in which there, are, there is an increase of motivation, or at least the reverse of uh, apathy, uh, let's say an increase in goal-directed activity. Why is it so important? Um, uh, so first, because it's part of the definition. Second, because it's correlated with a lot of features that are quite important for the patient, including um, a functional impairment and including subjective uh, well-being. And it's extremely correlated, for example, in depression, but it's also the case uh, in schizophrenia. So it's important for the patient. Second, it's correlated with a lot of things, uh, and especially uh, the cognitive uh, performance. Well, that makes sense, right? If you're not uh, motivated, you will perform badly, not only in cognitive tests, but also in everyday life. Uh, so it might be important for that. And the third reason, and maybe the reason that I'm the most interested in, is that we psychiatrists suck at treating uh, motivation disorder. Uh, that's the case both in uh, schizophrenia and depression. Uh, in schizophrenia, the negative symptoms, including the uh, motivation deficits, are notoriously difficult to address uh, with, uh, for example, antipsychotics. And uh, in uh, depression, that's the case as well. If you look at different symptoms and you cluster the different symptoms, there is one big group of symptoms, including fatigue, uh, anhedonia, loss of interest, lack of energy, uh, difficulty to thought or to decide or to choose. All these things goes together. And this is a group of symptoms that predict uh, well, the, the, the least uh, answer to conventional uh, antidepressant, including SSRI. So if it's so important, I guess we should have a clever and fancy tool to measure motivation, right? And the kind of thing we use uh, currently is that kind of questionnaire, which are useful. Here's the Starkstein one. Uh, and as you can see, it's very clever because if you want to know if someone uh, is motivated, you ask him, do you have motivation? And if you want to... Uh, to know if it's apathetic, would you consider yourself as apathetic? So it's very, you know, you know it's very conceptual. Uh, I'm joking, but it, it makes a job, right? I mean, it's useful in a clinical point of view, but the problem is that it's quite difficult to link that with a physiology or, uh, and well, if you want to discover new drug and forcible to use, to discover new drugs in animal models, obviously you cannot use that kind of tool in animal models. What is missing? Uh, from a cognitive point of view, or uh, I mean, it's a description of motivation in terms of uh, well, cognitive mechanisms. And for example, you could imagine that you do nothing uh, because uh, you have a decreased sensitivity to reward, because uh, the goal of your action has no sense to you anymore, or uh, because it still has some sense, but uh, the cost of action, the effort you have to spend is too high, and so you do nothing for very different reasons. And as we saw before, it could relate to different uh, neural systems. So uh, in order to do that in the, well, uh, especially uh, Matthias uh, in the lab, but I, 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 I 
jumped in, uh, built a, a, a clinical battery to dissect, to, to, to evaluate motivation disorder, including uh, an evaluation of a sensitivity to this three dimension, so reward, effort, and uh, punishment, uh, with three types of behavioral tests, preference, performance, and learning tests uh, with computational modeling. And today I will talk mainly about preference and uh, performance tasks in, in depression. So first, uh, well, just to say that uh, the goal is to use uh, this, uh, the same test in a very different kind of neuropsychiatric disease. So I spoke about depression, but also schizophrenia with patient in neurology, with brain lesion, with uh, uh, um, uh, one of the PI of the team, uh, Raphael Lebouc, uh, with a patient with neurodegenerative disease, neuroinflammation, et cetera, et cetera. So to have a transnosographic approach and to use the same test with very different kind of uh, patient. So, First, a preference task. So it's quite simple task in which you will ask a participant uh, to rate, to give a, a notation uh, to different kinds of items. Uh, so uh, reward, effort, and punishment item, items to rate to what extent they're aversive or pleasant. You will ask them to do some choices, some binary choice between different uh, kind of uh, reward or different kind of effort. Which one do you prefer? To make some compromise, for example, would you accept to climb five floors to get a cookie? So compromise between effort and reward, effort and uh, punishment, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, intertemporal choice, would you prefer um, a small reward now or bigger reward later and something for effort and punishment? The usual way to analyze this is uh, basically to use the rating to predict the choices. So basically, you uh, plug the rating in a fancy equation, uh, here's a basic sigmoid. Uh, you use the ratings, and uh, you see to what extent you're able to predict the choice with uh, the ratings. Uh, and what you do when you do that, basically, is that you test to what extent the choice are consistent with the ratings, right? That's what you do. But obviously, when you do the task, that's not what you do. You're not uh, thinking about the rating you gave earlier, five minutes ago, and uh, which was the higher and the one uh, which item I should choose. What you do when you do all these tasks is you rely on, I would say, internal values, hidden values, and you use these values in order to make all these tasks, ratings, choice, compromise, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so the modeling approach we use, basically, it's basically to do that, so to uh, model all these tasks together within the same model, so the rating, the choice, uh, and uh, fitting the hidden values, the internal values, as three parameters of the model. So basically, you have the same equation. So for example, so some sigmoid in order to predict the choice. Uh, also so some sigmoid in order to, uh, because the ratings are bounded. So if you have a, a, a continuous uh, value and you have to map it on a, a, a scale between zero and one, you have to use some uh, a saturation function, so a sigmoid. And, uh, but what you plug in this equation is not the ratings, it's directly the parameters uh, representing the different items and the free parameter that could be positive it's, if it's appetitive or negative it's, if it's aversive, right? And what you get at the end is that kind of thing for one given subject, you get a distribution. Uh, each uh, number here will be one item, and you get a distribution of the uh, three parameters representing here the reward, uh, here the, punish the punishment, and uh, the, the, the effort. And for example, for this given subject, uh, the punishment are more aversive than uh, the effort. And you also get some uh, three parameters uh, for the task, but the important thing is that the three parameters are uh, um, generic to all dimensions, so they cannot explain the differences between dimensions, right? So it's, for example, to what extent you're a stochastic or not in your choice in general. Um, so we uh, uh, validated this approach uh, with my two fantastic students, uh, Pablo Carrillo and Claire uh, Jaffray. Uh, we did some simulation and recovery approach in order to verify that we were able to uh, recover the parameters we inject in the model. We did some uh, test retest validation with the same participant twice for weak support in order to verify that uh, well, it means something to the participants. So we get basically the same thing uh, when you do the test twice. And we uh, use it in a uh, um, patient with depression compared to uh, healthy controls. So we compare a group of 35 uh, part, uh, depressed patients to controls, match in terms of gender, age, education, uh, and obviously not match in terms of uh, symptoms. And uh, 
just because it's something that uh, uh, I think it's an important thing. Uh, we discussed a lot about that with reviewers of the paper. Uh, our group of patients was very heterogeneous. We had some bipolar patients, some unipolar patients with different kind of treatment. Uh, personally, I think it's a force, uh, but reviewers disagree with that. Uh, and so we could discuss if you if you want about to what extent it's a good thing or not to have a, a very specific kind of patient, selected kind of patient or not. But just for you uh, to know that in this study, it was very heterogeneous. So uh, we... Uh, Use this task, and um, uh, when we compare, for example, to the, the mean of a distribution for reward and punishment between a patient and control, what we observed is nothing. There was absolutely no difference in terms of reward or uh, punishment between patient and uh, control. It was quite surprising to us. I mean, at the beginning of the project, we were really, I mean, I was really thinking about anhedonia in depression. I was re really expecting some difference in terms of, uh, uh, of, 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 of reward. And uh, the quite strong uh, and impressive, uh, I mean, in terms at least on, in terms of stat statistics, it's really, really uh, significant, was uh, a difference uh, uh, in terms of effort. Effort were more uh, aversive for a patient with depression compared to uh, um, healthy controls. Okay, so uh, it was the first kind of task, so preference task. It's all declarative, right? You just ask the subject, you don't ask them to do anything, to do an effort. And so uh, we decided to use in the same participant, within the same participant, a second type of task, which are performance tasks in which you ask participant to do an effort to get a reward. For example, to squeeze a grip, like we saw yesterday, in order to get some money. And uh, the rule of the task is that the payoff is proportional both to the performance you do, so the, the maximal force you produce, and uh, the reward at stake, so you can play for one euro, 20 euros, one cent, uh, or in between. And we have a, a, a motor version of the task and a cognitive version of the task in which you don't have to squeeze a grip, but you have to resolve a series of uh, strip, numeric uh, strip, uh, as fast as possible. And the higher you get, so the, the faster you are, the more money you win at the end. Okay. Um, so when you want to model that kind of task, so that was done uh, in the lab before by uh, uh, um, Raphael Lebouc and uh, Lionel Rigou, uh, usually the kind of thing you do is that you have two terms. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing I do as well. That uh, you have two terms, a benefit term and a cost term. The cost term, the benefit terms is given by, by the task because the, the money at stake is proportional to the force produced, the performance produced by the participant. And you have a cost term, which is explosive, meaning, meaning that the harder you squeeze, uh, the more costly it is, and it, it increases with time, with fatigue. So the more and more you squeeze and the more costly it is. And when you do just the subtraction between the two terms, you obtain that kind of curve, the net value, uh, which means that for a given amount of money at stake, there is an optimal force uh, to perform. Uh, basically, if you squeeze harder, that's too costly. If you squeeze lower, uh, you, you don't earn enough. Uh, just for you to know, we rewrote the model because we thought that when you do the task, you're not selecting directly the force you want to produce. You decide to invest a quantity of resource. You could say it's effort or neural drive or whatever you, you, you want, depending on the task. Uh, and uh, obviously, you could decide to invest all the resource you have. You... Uh, I mean, the, the, the performance will be stuck at some point, right? I mean, even if you contract all your muscular fibers, at some point, you have, there is some physical limitation. And we wanted to make that explicit, meaning that we built a, a saturation function linking the resource to the performance. It's a very basic uh, function. We compare different versions of the function. Here, you, as you can see, just a resource divided by the resource plus the constant. So it produced some saturation effect. Uh, we choose this function because it was mathematically equivalent to previous version of the model. So it was exactly the same model, but just uh, uh, the, the goal was to make the resource explicit, uh, 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 which was not the case uh, before. But apart from, the, from that, the model is the same. So you have this uh, benefit term, this cost term, uh, the net value, uh, and again, um, uh, uh, an optimal uh, quantity of resource for a given amount of money. And you have some three parameters uh, that uh, define the weight of reward, the weight of cost, and uh, fatigue. 
you have an hidden free parameter in the model, which is the maximal performance that could be reached by the subject. For example, for the muscular, uh, I mean, the physical version of the task, that would be uh, uh, the maximal, uh, the theoretical maximal force, meaning that if you contract all your fibers, uh, what force do you reach? And uh, it's informed by a morphometric measure uh, of, uh, of a subject, for example, the muscle. Here, it's a typical student in the lab, if you want to... Uh, Come. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, so you infer the, this free parameter by uh, the, the, the morphometric measure. Obviously, you cannot do that for the cognitive version of the task, so it's a, it's a flat prior, but uh, you can do this for uh, the physical one. So here is another typical student in the lab. Uh, so uh, uh, um, uh, okay. So again, we validated the approach. We did some simulation and recovery in order to ensure that we were able to recover the parameters. We did some test to test. It works. I mean, it's correlated. When you do the tax twice, you obtain some correlation, strong correlation between the three parameters, and we compare pa patient with depression and healthy controls. And uh, what you observe is again no difference. Uh, or basically no difference in terms of weight, I mean, sensitivity to reward, the weight of reward, and a quite strong and significant difference in terms of sensitivity to effort, which is the parameter that discriminates the most for two groups. You also observe some difference in terms of maximal performance. We could discuss about that later if you want. But the main uh, difference, as in the preference task, was in, in difference in terms of sensitivity to effort. So again, uh, our group of patients was very heterogeneous. We had some very uh, uh, well, bipolar, nipolar patient with different kind of treatment. Uh, in order to, to, to satisfy reviewers, uh, we uh, did this analysis. I mean, the, 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 the study was not devised com to compare patients with uh, uh, bipolar or nipolar depression. That was not meant to that for sure, but just to be sure, we just compare only the patient with bipolar to the control, et cetera. And basically, the result was present in all subgroups of patients. It was very robust, and it seems to not be specific to one particular type of patient. OK, so interim conclusion. Uh, we use some computational typing of motivation. We wanted to evaluate the same dimensions with a completely different task. And I think it's important if you want to uh, ensure that your result could be extrapolated to the real world, that you, the results you get are not specific to one uh, given uh, task. And what we observe is an increased sensitivity to effort in depression in all the tasks we used, including the learning task, but we could discuss that later. Uh, we have some ongoing studies in. Uh, over uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. So um, some uh, studies in depression with drug naive patients, for example, it's ongoing with treatment resistant depression to what extent to see to what extent we observe a specific pattern in these patients uh, with patients with schizophrenia. And there, there, is, there are some wonderful papers by Raphael Lebouc with uh, a patient with a frontal, frontal temporal dementia. So again, it's a transnosographic approach. And uh, just for to show you that we don't observe exactly the same thing in all groups of patients, I will uh, show you briefly uh, the results in patients with uh, schizophrenia, just to, to, to show you that in this patient with schizophrenia, so 35 patients with schizophrenia compared to healthy controls, there was no difference in terms of sensitivity to effort, while here, what was different in the two tasks, so the, 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 the physical and the cognitive version of the task, was the difference in terms of sensitivity uh, to reward and also uh, in terms of maximal performance only for the cognitive version of the task. Okay, so I said that I think it's important to uh, evaluate the same dimension with different tasks. Uh, obviously, the good thing is when you find the same thing with all the tasks, right? I mean, that's an easy uh, uh, thing, and you're happy when you find that. It was not the case for uh, the uh, schizophrenia study. Uh, actually, uh, when you look at the schizophrenia study, in the performance task, we observe this difference in terms of sensitivity to reward, but in terms of preference task, we observe a difference in terms of sensitivity to effort. So I'm not sure how to interpret these results. If you have any idea about that, I would be very happy to take it because I'm struggling to, to make sense of this. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, the drawback of using different tasks. Sometimes you find uh, uh, different results uh, in the same patient. And so it's more difficult to interpret. What is the future? The future is that we want to uh, see to what extent this task could be useful uh, from a clinical point of view. So to uh, predict uh, uh, 
two minutes? Yeah, perfect. Uh, to that extent, we were able to uh, predict the response to treatment in a uh, um, patient with depression. Uh, so uh, we heard earlier about the fact that dopamine might be linked, for example, to sensitivity to reward and not to sensitivity to effort, with, uh, uh, that was uh, cited in a previous uh, talk. Uh, and the idea in this project is, it's an ongoing project, we just began a few uh, weeks ago, uh, we will recruit uh, 100 patients with depression, uh, we will uh, test them with basically the test I just showed you, so preference and performance task with fMRI, and uh, we will randomize them in two different kinds of treatment, uh, um, vorsioxetine and escitalopram, two different antidepressants, and we will try to predict the response to these two different antidepressants at four weeks with a long-term follow-up at one year to see to what extent this test could be useful to uh, uh, um, well, to, to, to see if we can say something about uh, actual clinical uh, outcomes. And uh, as I said, that's the most important uh, conflict of interest I have because uh, I'm uh, very proud of the fact that uh, this study was partly uh, funded by uh, the laboratory Lundbeck, even if it's a, it's a academic trial and not, uh, um, yeah. Uh, so I would like to thank you for your attention and I will be happy to uh, take any uh, questions. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm wondering with regards to your uh, results on schizophrenia yep. patients, hmm? uh, if they're on any antipsychotic medication that might affect their... Yeah, sure. You know, That's a good question. Of course, I mean, um, yeah, all, all the patients in the, in the schizophrenia group, all the patients were treated because basically it's not possible to do that kind of test with patients that are... Uh, completely delusional, agitated, and obviously that's not possible. So they were treated. They were treated uh, um, in the long run. So it was a stabilized uh, patient. The treatment has not been changed in, since three months. Obviously, uh, so they were stabilized, meaning that there, there, there is only uh, the long-term treatment and not some sedative uh, treatment for these patients. And, um, uh, but obviously in the treatment they received, there were some anti-psychiatric drugs, meaning that some anti-dopaminergic drugs that could, I think it's the, 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 the idea you have, that it could affect, of course, sensitivity to reward. Uh, the important thing, I mean, again, it's not, so it, what I can say is that uh, the sensitivity to reward was not correlated to uh, the charge of anti-dopaminergic drug. And especially in this group, they, they, uh, approximately half of the patients were treated by clozapine, which is an antipsychotic, uh, anti basically without any, I mean, with a very little effect of, on dopaminergic uh, system. And uh, the, the, the results were the same in this group of patients. So I don't think it's linked to uh, the dopaminergic uh, effect of a drug, but I mean, to be sure you will have to treat uh, I mean, to, to test untreated patients, which might be uh, difficult in practice. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, here in the front. <laughs> that was a really yeah. great talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this effect that, or the absence of effect of, of the kind of incentives in, in depression, because yeah. I guess the there are really robust effects in depression of like self-referential processing and 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 at first, especially yeah. in the aversive domain. So, how does that relate to your findings? Yeah. And are you looking at kind of the right? Uh, yeah, well, that, that's a that's, that's a fantastic question. Of course, I mean uh, the first thing is that it's very small sample, so obviously we cannot rule, rule out by this uh, um, uh, study that there is no altered sensitivity to reward in depression. I mean that would be completely insane to say. Well, I, I prove that there is no uh, alteration of sensitivity to reward. Um, it's just that in, at least in uh, uh, um, value, I mean, uh, effort value compromise, at least it seems that the, 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 the emphasis on effort might be, at least in that kind of decision, it could be higher than the, 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 the weight or, or, or on reward. It might be as well that uh, the, the altered sensitivity to reward, we have some uh, preliminary results showing that maybe uh, the sensitivity to reward might be more altered in some 
patient, maybe patient with treatment uh, resistant uh, depression. And actually that's uh, one of the, the idea we want to test it, to test with a clinical trial because I didn't say it, but we will compare uh, an antidepressant with a dopaminergic effect and an, anti an antidepressant without any uh, dopaminergic effect. And the idea is to see to what extent we could discriminate patient based uh, on that and to predict the differential effect of a different kind of antidepressant. So, so I, I do think that there are some uh, alteration of uh, sensitivity to reward in, 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 in depression, maybe not in all patients. I, I, I think that we, uh, maybe the sensitivity to effort was not emphasized enough uh, in, in, in depression. For example, if you just look at the criterion of depression, there is a lot of things about reward and not so, so much thing about uh, um, uh, efforts. So I do think it was overlooked, and I do think it's something we sh should take up, but I'm not sure about uh, any effect uh, on depression. The other thing is that uh, um, it might be important to, to disentangle um, sensitivity to reward and loss of an interest, which is uh, clustered together in the definition of depression. It's either anhedonia or loss of interest. It, it might be completely uh, different. And I do think that loss of interest is maybe more uh, important in depression than just uh, sensitivity to reward. Not yet. It's ongoing. <laughs> it's ongoing. Uh, it's a it's a project uh, of a lab. Uh, um, so 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 we are collecting uh, the the data right now. We have uh, uh, thirty or forty subjects out of the sixty. Uh, so maybe next year I could provide some uh, uh, some uh, some uh, yeah response to that question. My bet is that we uh, would observe we will observe some uh, uh, deficit in intrinsic motivation in this patient, but. I don't have a data yet. Yeah. That's a wonderful question. That's a wonderful question. It's typically something we would like to address. I don't have the answer yet. Um, but that's a wonderful question. I would, I, 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 I'm oscillating. <laughs> between the two so uh, i i'm not sure about my bet but i i i, I do think there is a pro uh, i mean there, there is uh, a self-efficacy issue in depression i mean that's i mean that's something that has been shown uh, and it's very obvious in the clinics uh but i i i i, I would I have the intuition, the clinical intuition, that there is also something about uh, um, uh, sensitivity to cost per C independently from uh, uh, um, uh, self-efficacy. So I, I my, my bet will be both. Uh, so, yeah, thanks. Uh, this is a question that is actually linked to the, the, the question before. Do, do you have some measures of self-confidence of uh, the... Your, not your in patients. this task. Uh, well, not, not in this task. Uh, we will have it in no, not not in this task. Uh, we 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 are conducting study with Marion Rouault in which we have some uh, metacognition and self confidence evaluation, but not in this uh, study and not in this battery. Okay, because uh, yeah, I was just wondering if uh, their lack of motivation was not driven by their um, low estimation or rather yeah. the estimation of the yeah. low probability to so, succeed yeah so yeah. that could be the case in uh so so first that could be the case in the performance task not in the preference one right yeah. when you have to rate to what extent it mm. will be aversive to do something that you cannot fail basically yeah. uh you cannot explain that with self-efficacy mm. uh but it could be that you have to invest more resource to to obtain the same uh, performance and so you estimate it as more costly so yeah, for 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 yeah, but but that's also why we decided to use different tasks in order to 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 uh, uh, address the same phenomenon with uh, to limit the possible uh, different interpretations. So I do think that using very different tasks is useful for to address that kind of stuff. I Thank don't you. have a very clear answer. We have a mic doesn't work, but I I can hear you. <laughs> wondering um did you actually benchmark your task-based measures against the questionnaires oh yeah okay uh, not benchmark i mean um yeah uh 
Okay. Uh, so, 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 so that's a question I anticipate. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, we, we, we add a lot of uh, questionnaire in this patient, maybe too much, actually. And so we have a lot of questionnaires, a lot of measures, a lot of correlations. Uh, nothing uh, resists to a correction for multiple comparison. We do observe some correlation, not very convincing, I must say. Uh, I mean, as you can see, it's not very it's significant, but it's I'm not convinced by this correlation. We do observe some correlation that might make sense. I mean, some, for example, some correlation between uh, um, sensitivity to effort and the apathy score and other kind of correlation that do make sense. We observe some correlation in a larger cohort of L3 participants, but not within, I mean, not very convincing correlation within our subgroup of patients uh, with, I mean, with our group of patients with depression. What I would like to do, actually, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of correlation with clinical questionnaire uh, uh, within a pathological patient. I mean, it's completely, I mean, what we, I, I, I am a fan of a kind of approach we just saw uh, earlier, but uh, within a group of patients, I'm not such a group, a big fan. And what we will try to do actually with, uh, I mean, I'm not sure it will work, but my hope with uh, that kind of uh, study is that we will uh, demonstrate that we are able to predict clinical outcome better with this test than with clinical questionnaires. And that will be the, the, the validation. Uh, and just last word, that kind of approach was done by Raphael Lebouc in patient with a stroke. And he demonstrated that uh, this kind of test, very short version of this test, three or five minutes, uh, could predict a uh, functional outcome better than uh, clinical questionnaires. And I think that's what you want to show. You don't want to show that your uh, complicated and long and painful test uh, is perfectly correlated to simple questionnaire. You want to uh, show that it's different and that it does a better job uh, to predict uh, patient outcomes. Thank you, Fabien.